have the same vegetable specialists. So that's why we're talking about squash today and the differences between summer and winter squash. So summer squash and winter squash are planted at the exact same times of year. Winter squash is called winter squash because it just stays around longer in the pantry, right? So when we think about summer squash, and like, you know, straight neck, crook neck squash, even these scallop squashes, you pick them when your fingernails can pierce into them. Like, they, you want a very delicate rock, because if you wait too long on those and they get tougher, and the seeds really start to develop, they don't taste as good anymore. They're kind of start to bitter a little bit. Um, Whereas winter squash almost look like pumpkins, right? And so when you're trying to, to harvest those, again, they're planted at the, I'll tell you some planting weeds here, so they're planted at the same time, but when you go to harvest them, you, if you push your fingernail into the side of that rind, it should not penetrate it. If it does, leave it on the vine longer because all the sugars haven't developed in there if you're trying to eat it. And if you're trying to just use it for decoration, then you would also want to leave it on the vine until your fingernail cannot easily penetrate it because the thicker that rind is, the better it stores, right? So if you want to put it on your front porch, let's say for decoration, then you don't want it to rot in a week. You want it to stay for a month or a month and a half or two months. Um, the other thing, and I'll show you this as we're going along, is you really want the stems to be corky. So this is a winter squash planting right here at LSU for a trial we're doing. If you're planting pumpkins or winter squash, you want as much sunlight as possible. So full sun is going to give you the most flowers and therefore give you the most fruit. And technically, you can plant them early March all the way through mid-September. Okay, we have a long window in South Louisiana for planting these. Uh, ideally, you would have them up on raised beds. Or, you know what I mean? Like if you're going to lift your rows a little higher, keep them where they're not going to be sitting in water. The plants can deal with that a little bit, but the problem is as those fruits start to bind off, if they're sitting in puddles, they're gonna rot before they're mature. Does that make sense? See, what's nice is a lot of these winter squash, some will, it depends on the variety, will root into the ground as that goes over, and it's harder to move those, but others don't root into the ground. So when the, the plants are really nimble, I like to keep moving the vines towards the higher spot in the garden. So if I have my row up like this, I keep shifting my vines towards that, so when the fruit develops, it's not sitting in the low walkways, right, where they're gonna rot. Um, if you're growing winter squash, which also include pumpkins, okay, for Halloween. So most people will want to harvest those about October 1st, right, since you have it all, all month for decoration. Then you got to shorten that planting window, right? So that planting window was mid-March through the end of September. If you're trying to plant pumpkins for decoration or winter squash for decoration, that latter part of June, really I like the last week of June through the first week or two of July. That's going to give them enough time because they're typically 80, 90 days or so until you harvest from an early October harvest. And these right here are sunlight, really great little um, pumpkin. Uh, this is Darling right here. These two are our top uh, producing jack-o'-lantern type pumpkins in one of our more recent trials. But most of the pumpkins that we grow in Louisiana aren't actually jack-o'-lantern or pepo, cucurbita pepo, but cucurbita maxima. They're more related to squash. And so these are Cinderella's. This is all coming off of one or two different plants. You can see the variation in them. But think about when you go to Whole Foods or Fresh Market or some of these higher-end grocery stores and they have those more squat pumpkins or the ones with the warts or the different colors. Jack-o'-lanterns are like five, six, eight dollars depending, you know, on their size. These are like the $20 pumpkins. Well, those $20 pumpkins, the fancier ones, are the ones we grow easier in Louisiana. So if you wanted to try it in your backyard, off for the fancier types. I'm gonna show you all some more pictures here in a second. So we wanna um, plant two or three seeds per hill. A hill isn't where you guys have to build up a hill, it's just a hole with two or three seeds in it, just in case one of them doesn't germinate, right? As they start coming up, I thin it down to one seed. And you're going to space those hills anywhere between three and six feet apart. So even if y'all have a raised bed, you can just do it on the corner and let it run outside of that raised bed so you still have room to plant in there. Pumpkins need a triple 13 or a complete fertilizer. When you first put up your row or if you have a raised bed, you want to incorporate that in there, okay? 100 foot row, four to five pounds, just make half a cup if it's 10 feet a row, okay? Where if it's a raised bed, I'd put half a cup to a cup in there. 
a little bit different soil than the soil on your ground and it needs a little bit more fertilizer because there's bark in those raised bed mixes and the fertilizer tends to stick to that bark rather than being available for plant uses. Here's one thing that we recently did. So I was talking to y'all about planting it in, you know, like Benjamin here in the ground. That's this little pumpkin coming up. Um, you can plant in the raised beds. We've even done many pumpkins. This was a recent trial we did this spring in hanging baskets. We had 12 inch hanging baskets. We planted three seeds in there. We thinned it down to one. And look at the pumpkins we grew in those as they were growing. And we got, you know, two to four pumpkins off of each hanging basket, depending on the variety, which isn't a lot, but it's kind of cool if you are in a small yard, right? Or you just have an apartment or you're just doing it for fun. You're not trying to do this to like have a big festival like today, right? Or to sell them. So I have a lot of friends who are about my age and they have young kids and they're always just trying to plant a pumpkin with their child, right, in the backyard. And they're not successful. These were really, really great. Now, I will tell y'all that if you do it in a 12 inch hanging basket, the pumpkin plant, the roots were bound up in those pots. They were really tight. So I would probably expand that and then these hanging baskets, I know you can't see them here, but they are the ones with the little thin wires. They were a little too heavy for that. So every now and then we'd come out to our trial and one would snap or pop off, right? So we'd have to twist it back on. So are the pumpkins, do they sit on the ground? Because it doesn't seem like they could hang. They, there's a pumpkin hanging off right there. I'm going to show you. They're, these were the miniature pumpkins, you know, like the little the actual jack o lantern shaped pumpkins, but the tiny ones that are no more than maybe half a pound, quarter pound each. So they were really, really small. They wouldn't be to carve later. They would be to paint, you know, or just to fill up a bowl. Um, anytime you grow pumpkins in containers, I would recommend more like a five gallon bucket or a bigger container for this. Just make sure it has drainage and you have to maintain that soil moisture. So if you look at squash plants and cucumbers, even in the morning, they always look perky in the afternoon, they all kind of look like this, even in the soil that's wet. So in pots, they look even worse, right? So we had to set our timers on these. We have a little round drip tube in each one of these pots going down. And um, we had to set them coming on in the morning and in the afternoon because the soil just dried out too quickly in that atmosphere. Um, when we harvest it, no matter if it's a summer squash or a winter squash, and I'm sorry if you all these are pretty pictures, they just not feel kind of fuzzy here. Um, you want to harvest them with clippers because you want to leave a handle on them. Even your summer squash will rot in a day or two if it doesn't have a little bit of a spin. Same with your uh, winter pumpkins. So see right here, this is a cha-cha. This is a kabocha squash, which is a cucurbita maxima. You can eat this great for like this or, you know, chopping up the inside and roasting it. But a lot of these kabochas are really pretty and they'll store in your house if you have your air conditioning, you know, kind of normal and you're not running the heat up at 80 or anything. They'll store in your house for months, no problems. They make great decorations as well. But, but what I want y'all to see is, can you see how that stem has a lot of green still strewn through it and there's just a little bit of that tan color or quirkiness? I harvested this one just a little too early. If that stem would have been a little more brown, right, or quirky appearance, that would be a little bit better for that squash right there. Here's the miniature pumpkins on those hanging baskets. See how cute? I and mean, this is really fun. And like school gardens, this this is doable, right? You know, it's always see that poor schools, they well, first off, they come back to school too late to start the pumpkins for Halloween, but I always see the pre-K teachers planting the pumpkins and everything. So I'm like, you'll just have them for Thanksgiving, you know, just for for Halloween. Um, these actually guys, we had this was a hanging basket trial of tomatoes. We just clipped the tomato plant off the top, left the roots in, put our pumpkin seeds in. And look how good they grew. We started with garden grow um, soil mixture, which is an LSU recommended mixture. Um, we didn't even add any pre plant fertilizer to it when we cut the tomatoes out. We just gave them for four weeks straight weekly applications of Peters 20 20 20. And that was two tablespoons per gallon of water. And we got that right there. Um, we have a few pests on them, fruit worms, we get on pumpkins, so you'll have to watch for that. They kind of pour into there. These are um, stink bug nymphs right here and a little bit of leaf miners. Leaf miners I don't worry about. That's all cosmetic. It's not anything to try to spray for. But so I'm telling you, they look good, but they, you know, they have a big problem. 
So we did not put any insecticides out on these at all, and I think that's why we have this fruit where it's heavy cattle, bees, bee, or maybe a farm you would have had that problem. I don't want y'all to look at all this, but I wanted to tell y'all the three that we like the best as far as what did well in these hanging baskets and produced three or four pumpkins per basket versus one to two were um, a variety called Gold Dust. And you can see how small they are, right? They're just tiny little pumpkins. Casparita did very nice and was white, so the mixture of the two, you know, in your uh, bowls for decorating and stuff was great. And Pixie produced a lot for us as well. Versus these two didn't do well. That one mix, it's a cool looking pumpkin, but we had several baskets in there that just never even produced the pumpkin. So if you're doing this, you want at least a pumpkin per basket. And then Weedy Littles. And Weedy Littles have been around for forever and they're toted in the magazine. I just don't like them. And it's not even in the hanging basket, y'all. They don't even do well in the ground. Weedy Littles just don't produce here in Louisiana. So what I'm saying is if you're looking in um, magazines for seeds, ignore those and don't waste your money is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, for the kabocha squash trial, our top three winners in that trial um, are over here. This is geisha. And it, they kind of look silver in this picture, but it was more of like a light green color with silver green spots on it. I'm going to show you a whole more picture of it. This is golden butthole. These were gorgeous, especially when you think of fall decorations and that kind of thing. And they, they just produce and produce, I mean, tons of fruit per vine. So it was really, really great. And these are Sakochi greens. And we got high numbers of those, not high like weight, but they're tiny, kind of like those miniature pumpkins. So again, just blending things all up together is really nice. Now, if you're not caring about doing this for a living, then there's some other kabochas that we really like. So this one, starting down here, is Sweet Mama. It's just a dark green one. Sunshine is just pretty much straight orange going around it. Um, and these are maybe six, eight inches across and kind of squat. Uh, Winter Sweet is right here. It's all silver and it looks really good in like, you know, in big baskets or on front porches with some of these. Um, cha Cha is a little bit bigger than the Sakochi, but not as big as some of these. So they may be like four or five inches across in diameter. Uh, Amber Max looked pretty, but they didn't produce a lot. So I would go with the Golden Butter Bowl, mostly the other orange one that I just showed you right here. Because when they're kind of more green on the smaller side, but if you let them mature a little more, they turn more orange. Um, and then here, geisha. This is how that geisha should have looked in that first picture. See how it's kind of grained up a lot of silver spots all over it. Really, really pretty. And we don't think of ourselves as a pumpkin growing state here in Louisiana. We think of like Tennessee and North Carolina and up north a little bit more. They have more sandy soil and it drains a little better and they just produce more pumpkins. But on these winter squash, we can make some really good fruit, you know, in small gardens. And then our acorn squash trial, um, the three top producers. Now these are, um, they have fun shape. They're really tough, thick. On the kabochas, you're gonna get those to store probably two or three, maybe even four months easily. On the acorn squash, we're seeing they're probably storing more like eight, 10 weeks, okay? They don't store for as long. Yes? The kabocha squash, are they all edible? All of them are edible, yes. Okay, and they have orange flesh? Orange, all of them are orange on the inside. Yes, yes. On, on the acorn squash, they're pretty much all orange as well on the inside. Now, Autumn Delight is a great, um, as far as like number of fruit and, and weight of the fruit. This one, we're still doing the, uh, the storage trial on this one right here, so I can't tell you, but from some of the other states that are doing this with us, it's a multi-state trial. These trials are called squash out hunger trials. So what we're doing is we're trying to see which uh, winter squash to do best in terms of yield, right, for our farmers. Um, but we also want to see if like we were to donate them to a food bank without being refrigerated, how long do they store? So we're trying to think of, you know, like how we can keep that. Because a lot of food banks don't have a lot of cold storage area, but they still need a lot of fresh produce, right? So um, these are all kind of just dark green on the outside. The aces, there's um, several aces in this variety. They kind of have that like, spade-like taper to them at the bottom. Tato um, is dark green on all sides. You don't see it on these two, but I turned this one on purpose in order to know if your acorn squash are ready to harvest. Not only is it the corky skin and the, you know, not being able to penetrate your thumbnail through the side of it, but also you want to see this little spot, kind of like on a watermelon, right? Where it was sitting on the soil. That should be a darker orange color, and you know that it's maxed. It's sugars inside. 
And I know y'all don't think of these as sweet vegetables, but they need a little bit of that sugar in there for that flavor. Like, you know. But I wanted to show you, this is a little display I put on my mom's table. Because I was like, well, you need these for decoration because they're so pretty. These didn't do as well. These are the tank bells right here. But here we have one called Heart of Gold, and it's white. And it has just in the suture ones, it has the dark green stripes, perfectly orange on the inside. All of these are orange as well. Um, and then uh, the mashed potato here. This is a white one, but mashed potato is not orange on the inside. It's white on the inside. But you would cut it open, pull the seeds out, and you know, roast the flesh or boil it maybe down and then make a soup out of it. So mashed potato is a great one. Heart of gold is a great one. They just didn't yield this high as the dark green ones. But for a home gardener, high yields aren't always everything, right? Sometimes it's what you're trying to get out of it. And this one in the back, it was mostly orange with like a light pale white, you know, in it. You can see it right here, pale white, and then green speckles. And that one's called Celebration. And Celebration is gorgeous. It's my favorite, just looking at the field. But when we counted and weighed out all of them, it wasn't one. I can't really recommend that maybe to a commercial grower, but I can definitely recommend it to a home gardener, right? Because we still got plenty of fruit off of it. And they just look pretty sitting there. Can I um, ask you a question about yeah. that? Yeah. So would that be strictly more of a fall plant, or would we do that early spring also? So you can plant these starting March through the end of September, no problem. So they will stay, the vine will stay with you? The vine will stay with you until we get a freeze. And then it's just gonna, it's because it's a, it's an annual plant, right? right but gonna, as soon as we get a, a what well, y'all don't freeze down here. So but, what about temperatures here? We don't get below maybe 40 degrees. And if we 40? get below 40, we go for one day. Will they survive that month? Oh yeah, they'll, the, the, they'll survive. The thing is when it starts getting super cool, like if you start having, you know, 50 degrees during the day and 40 degrees at night type temperatures, you're just not gonna get flower production anymore. So what you might as well rip it out your garden and place it. What do you think about it as a food source? As a food source for? Eating, for us eating. All of these, winter squash? Yes. Definitely. All so of these I'm showing are would you fry it? Would you bake it? Would you? So the um, and I'm leaving after that question. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Right. So you would you some people will pull the rind off and boil the flesh a little bit, or boil the fruit and just scoop the flesh out. Some people will um, take it, cut it in half, and scoop the flesh out. They kind of put it in chunks, little cubes, and they roast it in Thank the you. oven with maybe rosemary or maybe a little cinnamon. It depends on if you want. Which is probably something I need to grow. Yeah, I might need you to come see my garden soon. Yeah, and uh -huh. tell me what size faces and so forth. Okay, uh -huh. I use a lot of Sugarland soil. Have you heard of it? I've heard of Sugarland soil. Yes, yes. that's all my raised beds are filled with it completely, okay. and then other things. I side dress a lot. I do a lot of nitrogen. Will this hurt my plant right here? You don't want too much nitrogen on these plants, so we're going to put a, a medium rate of fertilizer to start them out, and then side dress a little bit, but. Yeah. Too Thank much, you. Too much nitrogen. I'll see you guys on this. We're going to talk I'll about. I'll see you after. Okay. Insects. Um, like right now, we're getting towards the end of the fall. All the crops are being harvested, right? So like, y'all may not think about it being here in New Orleans, but but the wheat, or not the wheat, but um, more wheat's being harvested right now. Wheat and you know a lot of the soybeans are being harvested right now, things like that. So you're going to see in the fall, like early fall, late August, September, early October, with some more insects coming in especially moths and they're laying their, their plants or their babies here on your garden versus because those big field crops are out right now, right? So sometimes if you flush nitrogen too late in the season on these because you're still trying to, oh, I can get one more crop out of this, you know, squash I've already harvested. All I can eat more, but let me just keep it in. Then the moths come because they see this bright green, green growth and they lay tons of worms on it. So you gotta be careful. I want to talk to y'all just for a second about insect management on this because how are all squash pollinated? Okay. By bees, right? By insects moving back and forth. So we're trying to kill bad insects on these without hurting good insects. You know, that's tough, right? But there's sometimes um, where you got to really look at this and if you meet this threshold, I'll show y'all some pictures where things are eating down, you may have to apply some insecticides. Um, what things I want y'all to look at if you're ever going to apply insecticides on your crop is the PHI, and that's whether it's an organic insecticide or a conventional, okay? Both have a PHI on it. Just because you spray something organic doesn't mean you can go and lick it right after you spray it, right? It's still a side or a filler. So this means this right here, when you see the PHI on the bottom, that means 
the amount of time you need to wait between spraying and harvesting, the pre-harvest interval. It's usually one to three days. It's not a lot on anything labeled for vegetables. Some of these, though, can get kind of high twenty days, so you need to look at that. Make sure the vegetable crop that you're spraying is on that label. That is super important for squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, anything in that cucurbit family. Because the bees are there, they're not going to label like neonics on this for, you know, for home garden use because they know it'll hurt the bees as well. And then check and make sure that if it says, you know, wear gloves when you're mixing it to wear gloves. Um, even with the organic insecticides, a lot of times if you read the labels, it will say wear a long sleeve shirt. And that's because they use a lot of like oils in there and stuff. So if it's a hot day and you get that oil misting up on you, you know, it can cause like rashes and burns and stuff. It's not meant for you, it's meant for the you know, you know, so. And you look at cucumber beetles look like little ladybugs that are green, okay? They're a problem in squash because can y'all see this white stuff oozing out of the base of the plant? Their mouths, um, sometimes they vector xanthomonas, it's a bacteria. And when they eat on your squash, they like to eat on the roots of the plants. It'll fill up with the bacteria, and this is the base of that squash splitting open and all that bacteria oozing out, and that whole plant is going to collapse in a day. So see what I mean? Sometimes we have to take care of insects. So that helped out a lot with the pictures. Um, this is the problem. Here's a cucumber beetle. This is one of my squash trials. And here's two bees in this flower. So what do I do? Do I spray an insecticide that may hurt those bees? Do I, as a farmer, let my crop just get completely obliterated? You, you know what I mean? I'm stuck in a position here, right? So what I want y'all to do is, if, you're, if you have any cucurbit crops, like winter squash or any of these things, you want to spray it dust. If I see this during the day, I just leave that to you. Bees are going to go back to their hives in the early evening, and if I come out right before it's dark, and I put a little insecticide out, it's a lot safer than if I just went over the top right there and hit those bees, okay? So that's why I really want you to check that cucumbers or winter squash or pumpkins are on there because they're trying to only label things that aren't going to also the residue affect the bees. Does that make sense? Um, squash vine borers, this gets in your pumpkins and squash and things like that. You're gonna see a little hole in the side of the thing with this sawdust, this orange coming out of it. And I broke this plant open, but if you break it open, you see that the moth came to lay her baby right there, and then it bored in, and it's going to keep the interior of your plant and disrupt the xylem the so the plant's going to go over too. So for this, you can use um, like seven spinosad, things like that, by Fendrin. But what a lot of people do is they'll put floating insect covers over their plants at the beginning of the season, and they'll take them off once they start seeing the blooms. So you have to have the insects once they're blooming, otherwise you're making a fruit. But in the early part of the season when it's just leaves, a lot of those adult moths right here are out, and if they can't lay it on your plants, they can't lay their eggs in your crop. Does that make sense? So then we take it off once we start seeing blooms, let the bees get in there and do their thing. Um, you can also, I broke this open just for effect, but you can take an exacto knife and not cut across the stem, but down the stem, right where you see that little hole for in, and just peel it open and pull that in white little maggot out, put it back together and put a rubber band around it. You know, like just cut a rubber band and, and use it as like a, a cast and it'll be fine. Okay, it'll keep growing. As long as you get it early before it's wilting. Uh-huh. So they're uh, getting this, the, having this problem is only coming from the moth itself. It's not something, they wouldn't like be in your soil from the year before or I don't remember the exact life cycle, but I don't think so. I think it's from the adult moth coming in in the early spring. We need to go talk to Raj outside uh, to be sure. I just have had a consistent problem with it, so um, I'm, I'm off squash for a little bit to yes. see if you, that it, helps. But I would say usually I would say rotate between families at least season to season, right? So if you have cucurbits in the spring, then in the fall don't plant you know anything in that family. Right? Especially down here in New Orleans, because you'll just plant whenever you want, whatever you want, okay? Plant some broccoli and some mustard greens. If you start getting uh, the squash vine boards really bad, I've waited an entire year before in my garden before I put them back in mm -hmm. to kind of get them to forget about it because they, they sort of know their locations, you know? And once they know you have squash over here, they're coming back for you every year. I don't know how the insects know that, but they, they know. You know? Now, other people will also take their individual squash plants, whether it's winter or summer, 
and they'll wrap it with foil at the base of that stem and then plant it so that half the foil is below and half the foil is above the stem. And that kind of makes like a barrier for that mom laying her eggs. However, I've seen those holes, drill holes go up higher in the plant too. So they're not that, they, they just live a little higher than sometimes. But that's, that's a problem. Now worms, okay, these are melon worms, they're pickle worms. This is some of our squash out there. You can see it's like our, our phones are like done and we're just picking kind of the last little bit of root out of there. And in like in a week, this can happen to you. See how they damage the outside of the rind? So that's not good for anybody who wants to keep this around because this squash here, while the inside is still good, the outside is damaged up so much that there's no storage on it, right? So you can't keep that. And then of course, a commercial grower definitely couldn't sell that. Um, you notice mostly when you're walking through your plants, if you see big pieces of what looks like dirt, it's the frass of the, of the um, worms and the caterpillars on the plants, then you now I know look for these little guys underneath the leaves. Um, again, bifendrin, spinosad, 7BT is going to be great on this, but at this stage right here, if I have this many worms on my fruit or on my plant, BT is going to affect their guts. It also causes growth regulation on them. It takes like 7 to 10 days for it to work. So it's organic insecticide, but I can't wait 7 to 10 days at this stage. So I mean, I need to use something a little harsher. So you just got to kind of think about what you're using. This, I love, people show lots of pictures like this, and I feel like it's, no one who's in the farming industry in Louisiana is spraying anything so toxic that they have to get to this measure on your produce. I can promise you that. Okay, this is, there's a, I don't know, I think this is a little bit of a scare tactic right here. But again, if we're gonna spray any kind of insecticides or fungicides at dust, because we wanna keep our bees alive, um, we wanna double check that those cucurbits are on the label, we're only going to spray anything if there's like a certain threshold out there, right? So like if it's just one or two worms and you can knock them off, just knock them off, you know? If you see lots, then you need to spray it. I'm going to go through this quickly. Two things I want y'all to look out for if you have these things later in the season, still out there now, you're going to get powdery mildew. It comes on when the days are kind of cool um, and we're dry. So we've been having rain for a couple of weeks. We're going to see more powdery mildew in the cooler temperatures. And you can spray sulfurs or um, potassium bicarbonates on the both organically labeled. Uh, downing mildew, we're going to get earlier in the season, and it's going to be yellow spots on the top side of the leaf, and it's these brown spots with a little bit of gray mold on underneath. So these are things you want, and eventually it'll just kill out the whole plant right here. Copper fungicides work on this, it's organically labeled also. So you can spray that if you start seeing these things. I say if kids can do it, we've had a pumpkin growing contest the past two years where we mail out Cinderella pumpkin seed seed. These are all Cinderella's off the exact same seed batch, and you see the variation in them. Cinderella's are a great pumpkin or winter squash. They're actually squash for y'all to grow here. You can too. So I just want you guys to go out and try planting some of these squash. Again, like I said, even if you have a smaller area or a small raised bed or even a hanging basket, it's doable. Any questions? All right, I'll be around the show for a little bit.